And perfect. So let me go ahead and kick off. So good afternoon, good evening, everybody. You know, my name is Paul Roberts. I'm a principal architect here at AWS. Uh, I work with um, some really interesting customers and some of the most influential companies in the world. I've been working with the open source community for some time, uh, back even before Kubernetes really got off the ground and GitOps, I was doing a lot of work with OpenStack, as interesting that, as that is. Uh, today, I actually sit on the steering committee for the Spinnaker project, so I do a lot of work with the Netflix folks. And I'm just really incredibly excited to be speaking with everyone today. Uh, and you know, really in this presentation, I wanna talk about you know, some of the tooling that we're seeing here at AWS. I mean, there's a lot of tools out there that folks are using, and I want to drill into a couple of them. But I also want to take a step back in the past and just talk about, you know, how things used to be building up to, you know, where we are today. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and kick off. And I think there's this whole notion of, um, you know, as engineers and as developers, one of the things that, you know, we often look at is there's, there's folks are building new technologies and, you know, I see it quite a bit, you know, with, with teams that I'm working with, both internal and external, is that uh, they don't always understand or appreciate why something was built the way it was built. And, you know, at, at Amazon, we have this approach and we call it, um, and one of our tenets is respecting what came before. And, you know, I think with GitOps and everything that's happening today, it just makes a tremendous amount of sense, but we need to be considerate of, of how we used to do things previously. And, you know, I saw a prior talk from Kelsey Hightower, and I think he also touched on this a little bit. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how it started for me. So I'm going to take you back a little bit to 2006. And in 2006, I was working at Sun Microsystems. And uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Sun Microsystems, this was, you know, a legacy hardware vendor that, you know, had built a lot of platforms, hardware platforms, you know, Spark, they had an operating system, Solaris, they had technology like file systems like ZFS. And I was brought in uh, to manage data centers for them and manage you know, key infrastructure for them. And you know, one of the first projects I had was they said, Paul, we want you to come in and we want you to manage this appliance that we have deployed in U.S. data centers all around, all around the country. And I said, well, that's really not, that's not too difficult to deal with. That's not a big problem. I mean, it's not like we have thousands of data centers. I can easily manage that. And then... The team said, well, you know what, not only do we want to use U.S. data centers, we also want to use EU data centers, and we want to have these appliances running in there. And then the team said, well, you know, we don't only want you to manage the U.S. and EU data centers, we also wanted you to, to manage the Asia, Asia PAC data centers and all the appliances that are running in there. So we had thousands of appliances that were deployed around the globe. And we had a pretty lean team uh, that was responsible for deploying these, managing these in the full life cycle. And not only was it difficult to, to manage across all these different locations, and again, this is back in 2006, so it wasn't you know, AWS multi-region, multi-AZ. Uh, this, was, this was using you know, Equinix facilities or even our own facilities. So it was very manual back then. And so not only was it, the scale was kind of interesting, but uh, for those of you that may remember, re may remember is that Sun didn't only use one operating system. We used both Linux and, and we used Solaris. And not only did we use just Linux and Solaris, we also were multi-architecture. So we both, we had Spark and we had x86. So it was manage all these facilities, manage all these appliances in all these facilities around the world, manage two operating systems, and manage two different architectures to actually do these deployments. So how the heck do you manage all of these devices? It was super stressful. Uh, and so what, what was happening at the time was every time we would do a deployment across all these devices, it would take teams of two or three people up to six weeks to do these deployments. And why did it take six weeks? Well, number one, there wasn't really any automation. There wasn't any reconciliation to make sure that this, this was actually working correctly. And it generally took two to three people to, to do this because as we all know, like maintenance windows around the world are at different times. And we could only, at the time, we could only touch so many devices at once. So it, it, was, it was a huge pain point for us. So what did I do? What did, it, what did, what did I come up with? Um, so I think, you know, again, going back to the 2006 timeframe, uh, how would people automate back then? So I started thinking about it. I was like, well, you know, I can use uh, some SSH automation. I can push, push some keys everywhere. We had this really cool file system and it's still around today, which is the, the Zettabyte file system or ZFS. We said, oh, you know, we could create some snapshots. 
And then the third part of it was pulling out some, some pearl uh, Kung Fu here, where it's just like, hey, you know what? I want to I wanna leverage that. And I don't think there's a whole lot of pearl today, but uh, I ended up build, building a lot of tooling that would use SSH, ZFS, and, and Perl to help build this automation. And so what did that look like? And at the end of the day, I don't know how many of you have seen this, but it was kind of a lot of spaghetti code. And that spaghetti code, you know, it was pretty great when, when it was out. Um, and, you know, it wasn't called the Perl hotness. It was actually called Patch Master. Um, but these releases, instead of taking, you know, six weeks and two to three people, and ended up taking, you know, now, you know, one person, generally myself or another, you know, on-call engineer, and it would take about one to two hours. So while this was successful, when we started looking at the code and everything that was being deployed and how everything was being reconciled and how everything was being monitored, it certainly wasn't ideal. So then what was next? So there, there has to be a better way. And, you know, fast forward, um, you know, when I think about like Puppet, I think uh, Luke and team, I think Puppet was founded in 2005. And I think their first enterprise release is in 2010 or 2011. So it was, it was very early on where these, uh, these automation providers started coming on board, but um, it, it was really interesting, but you, you kind of had to learn their own specific languages. They had their own DSLs. Um, there was a lot of boilerplate that you had to work with. But the great thing was, is that you didn't have to work with, you know, my, my Perl spaghetti code anymore. You could work with something that was easily repeatable. And, you know, not only that, I mean, you know, people at the time, we weren't just using Perl. There was also, you know, things like expect when we were trying to manage and orchestrate, you know, network deployments or storage deployments. I just, it just really depends. So using this imperative model with, you know, whether it's Chef, Puppet or Ansible or Salt, it just really was a step in the right direction. And I, I wish I had had that, but there were still gaps. So there needs to be, there needed to be a modern approach. And we're kind of going in that direction today with that modern approach and how we're doing that. Specifically today is how folks are moving from, you know, on-prem or, you know, managed data centers into public clouds. And, you know, even with Chef or Puppet, you know, they're, and there's a lot of community engagement there. Um, I think when we started moving to the clouds, we started looking at new patterns. And some of these new patterns really flipped a little bit from declaring the end state, or I'm sorry, but from an imperative approach to now they wanted to declare an end state. And when you're declaring these end states, you could be using CloudFormation or you could be using Terraform. And not only could you be describing how you want your infrastructure deployed, it could also be your applications. So for me, when I look back, you know, on my past and I had to manage all these appliances, it would have been great to be able to use either of these technologies to lay down, you know, the, the frameworks and be able to handle the upgrades and be able to, to automate as much as I could. But, you know, moving forward, there still was more work to be done here. And looking as we're coming up to, you know, modern times, people, people have been writing their, their chef or their Terraform code uh, or um, templates. And they decided, well, instead of using you know, specific DSLs or writing in YAML, I want to write my infrastructure code or my application code actually by code. And this is something that we're starting to see at AWS. So it doesn't have to be you know, TypeScript. It could be Go. It could be Python. It could be a different language. But now we're actually seeing folks use things like AWS Cloud Development Kit. And we're seeing things like Pulumi. And what's really interesting here is that both of these tools, what they will do is they'll allow an end developer to write their code. And that code, if it's in CDK, it will then be uh, compiled, if you will, or translated to a CloudFormation template. And then on the Pulumi side, Pulumi is doing a, a really awesome job right now where they're actually building their own native operators. But historically, they've been using the Terraform providers to do this. So you could write your code with Pulumi, and then Pulumi would automatically translate that into your, your Terraform configurations and then deploy it. So it's saving a lot of time. But all of this is just, how am I going to be you know, deploying my infrastructure or my applications via code? So fast forwarding a little bit, um, now, People are looking at another way to do this, and you know, Kubernetes has certainly become you know the the one of the the, the standards for container orchestration and container deployment, and it's also becoming you know almost a, a cloud control plane, if you will. And so, there's two key technologies that we're starting to see, and that one of them that we're actively um, developing ourselves here at AWS, 
Uh, and those are both cross-plane and AWS controllers for Kubernetes or ACK. And what's really unique here is that instead of writing my, my code, my infrastructure code or my application code in a specific DSL or a, a YAML file that's specific to one particular provider, now what I can do is I can say, I wanna deploy my infrastructure. Maybe it's a relational database. Maybe it's persistent storage. Maybe it's a load balancer. And I can configure my infrastructure using Kubernetes APIs and Kubernetes manifests. And so today, both Crossplane and ACK can do this. And what's really neat is, is that if I start configuring all of this information within Kubernetes, it starts pushing me down the path of like GitOps. How can I fully manage this and deploy this and reconcile all of the changes that are going to happen? So one of the, the primary differences between ACK and, and Crossplane is that Crossplane today does support multiple compute primitives. So instead of just focusing on AWS, they enable you know, other primitives and other um, platforms such as like using Helm. And ACK, uh, we focus on you know, AWS resources. So whether that's you know, S3 or EOB or a DynamoDB table, but again, all of this can be orchestrated um, through, through Kubernetes, which is extremely powerful. So with that said, I wanted to think about, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know, the, the, the tools and the platforms that we have. So we just said, you know, cross-plane and using ACK can help quite a bit, but then what are some of the tooling choices that we're seeing our customers use? And there's a few out there. So first I wanna talk about Argo CD. And I think there's been a few talks about Argo today. And, you know, there's been, you know, a couple, a couple things that, you know, I've noticed from the community and what I've been, when I've heard from when I'm talking to various customers is that there's a lot of support from Intuit. And, you know, I think, you know, Intuit is, is a fantastic company, especially around tax day. I certainly love using their platforms. And I think the, the lessons learned that they've had with their own uh, deployment and their own automation has really given them a lot of insight on how to build some, some amazing tooling. And so a couple standout and notable things about Argo, which I think is really important, is that it's really easy to get going today with Argo CD. It doesn't take much time at all. And I think another huge you know, benefit for, for using Argo or Argo CD is that, is that the UI is extremely clean and crisp and super simple to use. And it's really easy for folks to be able to visualize these workflows. One of the things that I really appreciate with Argo is, is when I'm working with the platform and, and I can see that something is not in sync or I can see what my deployment is about to look like, or I can see that there, there is an issue with my deployment. So all of these, all of these are huge benefits. And you know, as, as we all know, the project was added to this, the CNCF uh, and it, it has been gaining traction across our customer base. So with that said, um, we actually have some documentation out there for our customers if you wanna get, uh, get going with Argo. Uh, so you can integrate Argo with EKS and there's a link. So I'm sure you can find that in, in our recording. So the next project I wanna talk about is, is Flux. And I have to say, you know, working with the Weave team, uh, I've been working closely with Cornelia and Alexis. Um, you know, what's really neat is that there's they, the Weave team has a lot of complementary pro projects. And a couple notable ones that stick out to me is, you know, Firecube, uh, Ignite, and, you know, yesterday, the GitOps core project that was just announced. So I think there's just a, a lot of thought leadership coming out of here. And I think, again, you know, Cornelia, Cornelia's work with the CNCF is really helping move the needle forward. And, and a lot of good things are, are, are happening here. So with that, you know, I'm seeing that Flux, I don't want to call it the standard, but we're, we are seeing a lot of adoption here and our customers are certainly interested in that. And these are customers that perhaps, you know, aren't as focused on having, you know, a really slick UI, but, you know, want to, you know, focus more using the CLI and some of the automation. So we are seeing adoption there. And then I just want to highlight, you know, the, the partnership um, between WeWorks and the, the Kubernetes community and ourselves um, there's just a lot happening there. So uh, definitely uh, a project that's moving in the positive direction and we're really happy to be uh, working with the team. Um, so I also included a link here on you know, how, we, how we can integrate Flux and Flux2 with EKS. So please feel free to check that out. But one of the other things that I wanna share is, is that we are seeing other projects begin to cons consume parts of Flux for their own, to enhance their own capabilities. And here, that is with the Spinnaker project. And you know, a couple of my colleagues here at AWS, uh, Nima Caviani and Rob Hilton, 
and team and others have been doing a lot of work with Spinnaker. And one of the things that we've been we've been working on is how can we migrate from an imperative approach to a declarative approach instead of using pipelines? How can we describe how we want the actual deployment to look? To, to look? And this is called managed delivery. And you know what's unique about managed delivery and, and Spinnaker in general is that this tooling is not Kubernetes specific. And so if you want to use something like a functions platform or a virtual machine platform or a container platform, Today, you can do that uh, with Spinnaker, which is really interesting. The other thing that we see a lot of is that our customers are using Spinnaker today within their pipelines. And you know, when Netflix open source this project in, in 2015, uh, based on you know, Netflix's learnings and their own capabilities, uh, we've, we've seen quite a bit of adoption. And so we're hearing from our customers is that they don't necessarily want to you know, move to a new platform, they actually want to augment their platform. And so, as I mentioned previously with Flux, is that with Keel, we've actually done some work to integrate Flux into Keel, specifically when we do our Helm deployments. So I think there's likely to be some consolidation happening. Um, and, you know, folks may say, if we want a great UI, maybe we'll look at Argo. If they want to use, you know, a multi-platform or multi-compute primitive, maybe they look at at Spinnaker, if they want to use something that has you know, a lot of thought leadership from companies like Weave and they want to see a lot of complementary tools, maybe it's a component of Flux. So there's a, there's a lot of different options here. And we're, we're only getting started on the AWS side with working with these various platforms and our customers are still getting going. So with that said, you know, where do we go from here? And you know, I just want to think back to you know, 15 years ago when I was working at Sun, and I had to deploy, you know, thousands of these devices that are all around the world. And it took me, you know, it took me a couple hours, but back then it was taking us, you know, six weeks before I wrote my spaghetti code. Uh, you know, things like GitOps and the different tools, uh, it just wasn't there yet. And I think respecting what came before of how we used to do it and how we, we what our approach to automation is. And I, I hope in my slides, you're able to see like there's this evolution that's happening. And I think we're still seeing that evolution happening where standardization is, 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 isn't quite there yet. But I think the innovation that's happening across these different projects is something really unique. And I think it's, it's, great, to, it's great to see that. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up. If there's any questions for me, uh, please, please let me know. Feel free to ping me in Slack. Otherwise, this is my email address and you can find me on Twitter.